So it's at this time, let's, uh, let's get into our study this evening. Uh, why don't you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're just going to take a look at uh, two verses uh, to open us up here. There's just one, uh, two expressions I want us to get in our mind as we go back to Genesis as we continue to look at the, the course of this world. And we'll go over to Ephesians as well to refresh ourselves uh, with that terminology. Uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. And let's look at verse 4. This is uh, going to be a passage that we're going to get to uh, in more detail as we deal with it back there in Genesis 6, I believe it is, uh, regarding the angels and, and things like that. But let's just read the two verses. I'll pray, and then we'll get into our study. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time uh, to get in your word tonight. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And, and faith alone in that, in your son, and what he did on the cross, uh, provides you the, the capacity to declare us righteous in your sight, having forgiven us all sins and imputing your righteousness unto us. Uh, when we believe that gospel, you respond by justifying us unto eternal life. And so I do pray if there's anyone here listening and have not done that, they, they would do that this very moment uh, because nothing else matters until they get that settled. So Father, we thank you for him, without him, and what he did. Uh, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't give a hoot about your word and the, the effectual working of your word and what you did in time past, what you're doing now, and what, you're, what you will do in the ages to come. But because of him and the, uh, how that you commended our, your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, uh, it has provoked us and worked in us in such a way that we desire to know more about you and, and your honor and your glory and your, your character and essence and who you are and what you do and why you do it. All those things that are provided in the scriptures has become our love, has, has become our affection. Uh, and if it's not, may it, may it get there. Uh, may we want that more than anything else that this world has to offer because that's the only thing that will have eternal value uh, in, in the life to come. There's nothing that we can take out besides knowing you and being edified in your word. So we thank you for that, and I do pray that as we get into our study tonight, uh, that we would uh, not just come to fill a seat, but to attend uh, to your word and attend to, to get the understanding and the profit out of the scriptures that you desire, uh, and that we would be attentive to that and incline, incline our ear to understanding these things uh, and cast aside the cares and concerns that we have in the world and be focused and, and, and have a pinpoint focus upon the issues that we're going to be taking a look at tonight. So we thank you for this time that we can redeem unto your honor and glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, if, uh, this, this, we're in Lesson 7 right now, and what we're doing is as we're, we're taking a Bible survey. We're going through the scriptures. Uh, we're not going verse by verse or anything like that, uh, but we're, you know, we're trying to get the, the wisdom out of the scriptures that are placed in there so that we have a, a comprehension, a, a fundamental understanding. I shouldn't say fundamental because it's going to be more than fundamental, but a, a thorough understanding and concise understanding regarding what God was doing in time past, what he's doing now, and what he will do in ages to come. And right now, as we begin, as we have been beginning, I know we're seven lessons into it, but we're still in Genesis, uh, there's, there's what's going to take place is the establishment of the nation of Israel. And we saw that there as God called out Abram from the Ur of Chaldees, and with Abram and his seed, he's going he's gonna to make a great nation. And the reason why we're doing what we're doing right now is because I want you to have some uh, frame of reference why uh, it's a great nation that he's going to create. Uh, why isn't it something else? Uh, why isn't it just one man? Why does it have to be a great nation? And what does that, term, what does that issue of great mean? Uh, is it just mean a, a great amount of number? Uh, or, or what does it mean? And all, all of that ish, all those things regarding that great nation and, and the Abrahamic covenant there as it's begin to start being, uh, God starts dealing with it uh, with Abraham in Genesis 12, all that understanding comes from the information prior to that. And there's some, there's 
many significant events that take place before Genesis 12 uh, that we shouldn't be ignorant of. Uh, there's a tendency, at least maybe not for you, but for me, uh, I know that when you go back to Genesis and you read things, it's kind of, oh, this is good, God's powerful, and, and look what's going on, wow, this is kind of cool, and, and you kind of just read it for that, but there's a lot more going on uh, that would provoke a, a, a deeper response than just that type of response. And so that's the kind of things that we're looking at. And last time we started to look at the issue of the course of this world. And there's something that takes place before the flood. There's an establishment of that course of this world. And also the, what, what Peter calls here the world of the ungodly. Look again at verse 5 in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says, and spared not the old world. And that has... A, a, a huge amount of, of, of significance to it, that expression, the old world. When you talk about something as old uh, in, in connection with, in a difference than what God's then doing after that old world or what he's doing now, uh, there's, a, there's a significance. Uh, if there was no big significance, no change, then you wouldn't come along and use that terminology, the old world. And that's highly important because of some things that we're going to be looking at that go into this great nation that God's going to establish. And it's, it's just genius of God in, in making this great nation and what's taking place uh, back there in Genesis chapters 4 through 11. And then he goes down and he says, uh, But save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And there's another expression that the world of the ungodly. And we're going to see how ungodly they, they were. And uh, there's something that God does. He brings in that flood and there's something that he does to man to make it so that that world or the world that, that comes after that, the new world order, you could, you could call it. Uh, no one likes to use that terminology, but really, uh, after the flood, there's a new world, as it were. And that's why he's, he's describing it here. is the old world, and now there's a new world. And God did some things so that the world wouldn't go back to how it was back then. That's how uh, wicked and ungodly that it was. And that's these expressions that uh, denote that very thing, describe that very thing, that back there before the flood, it was, a world of un it was the world of the ungodly. And, and it was the old world. Come back with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And see what uh, the Apostle Paul calls it. He's not so much referencing uh, the, the world before the flood. But he is referencing something that got established back there in Genesis. And we started to look at it last lesson uh, with Cain and Abel. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And look at verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the adversary, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And it, when you have a course of something, uh, there's, there's progression to it, there's uh, attainments to it, uh, there's, there's specific components, identifiable components to it. Uh, if you think of any type of education course uh, that you have to open up a book, you have identifiable components to it. You have a book. You go chapter by chapter. Uh, you go on the golf course. Many of you might golf. And you have uh, uh, identifiable components to the golf course. You have hole, the first hole, the second hole, the third hole. And within the hole, it's a par three, a par four, a par five, uh, that you have to, as many shots and that to get par or your bogey or birdie or uh, you get an Alcatraz. Yeah, I know some, I know, I know some golf terminology. And, and so all those things go into a course. And so therefore, when he comes along and describes that there's a course to this world, folks, there's a lot more to this world than just what meets the eye. All the, the, uh, Paul talks about this with the Corinthians, the fashion of the world and uh, the, the wisdom of the world. The world has its own uh, uh, wisdom to it. And it seemingly, to the, to the, to the physical eye and, and to the unjustified person's eye, it's very wise. And there's, there's, even within that, there's levels of attainment. Uh, you have a whole college educational system, or a whole uh, educational system is based upon that. It, it, it's following the, the wisdom of this world to live in this world, 
and you can you can start from your your your, your get a uh, a high school degree, you can and then you can go to college level, and then you can get your master's, your PhD, and all those things is just the the wisdom of this world, and and it's those things are necessary in some sense to live within this world, but you also got to be able to recognize what's going on behind all those things, uh, because it's important. Otherwise, it's easy. Folks, it can be very easy for us to be beguiled by the adversary. And, um, and usually when you start to recognize it, 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 it's not that it's too late, but there can be some damage that can be done. Well, anyways, I just wanted to bring those things up to describe something that gets underway, and that was back where we're at right now in Genesis. Come back with me to Genesis 4. Genesis 4. Again, this is what we dealt with last lesson. We dealt with Cain and Abel. And we dealt with uh, that Cain was not just, uh, not only did he just reject God, but he went uh, in direct opposition to God. He, he lined himself up with the adversary and, and ended up producing that way of Cain that we read there in 1 John. And what we're, what we're seeing, what we saw within that is that, again, Cain, uh, he brought the wrong offering in the first place. And God explained to them, he had already explained to them what offering to bring uh, that, that God would have respect unto. Uh, he didn't bring it, and therefore he sinned. And God even gives him the chance after that to, to, to tell them the sacrifice that you need, that you can, uh, what, how does he describe it there? Uh, verse 7 at the end, And unto thee shall be his des desire, that sin that lieth at the door, that sacrifice that lieth at the door, that could uh, bear his sin, as it were. Uh, it shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He could go and offer the respectable God-honoring sacrifice that God told him to sacrifice, and this could be a done issue, but instead of that, he doesn't do that. And he goes into a, a, a way which is in direct opposition to God. He goes and kills his brother Abel. And not only that, but his attitude when confronted with that, when, when, uh, when, when God asks him where, his, uh, where is his brother Abel, he says, am I my brother's keeper? And then we see from Cain's descendancy, his, his genealogy, as it were, there were, uh, as you go on in chapter 4, uh, in verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ, which seems not to be so significant. But when you understand that the adversary, when he, when he was Lucifer, he was created with, with tabrets within him. He led the praise and worship of, of Almighty God. And when he fell, he, he corrupted that very thing that was built within him. And so you see Cain's, Cain, who's lining up with the adversary's will, uh, the harp and organ, the, the handling of those things came from him. And there's a corruption of that. And then verse 22, and, and Zila, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And that was the issue of they made weapons of, of warfare to, to, to battle and things like that. And that came from uh, Cain's dis, uh, descendants. And then you have the issue of Lamech here. And Lamech, uh, in verse 23, halfway through, he says, Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and seven. He's describing that of himself. And it's like there's a boast going on. Hey, Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. And there's like this boast going on that, that he should get a, 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 a rougher judgment type issue there of, of being avenged and things like that uh, from, for what he did. And that's the things that we looked at before. And, and what we have with Cain, again, is the issue of that he lined up with the policy of evil. And with Cain, the adversary was, could, could start to establish the course of this world that not only would operate in ungodliness but in wickedness and, and Abel is God's man. It's, it's, Abel's a servant of righteousness and Cain goes right against God's servant of righteousness. Not just against any man but, but one that's following God. He, he persecuted God's man, Abel. And so we, we start to see that and, and this whole issue of just 
uh, just rejection and opposition and, and establishing the way of Cain. And, and also it was described that he was of that wicked one there in 1 John. And that wicked one being of the adversary, he lined himself up with not God, but the adversary. And folks, although this is just at a, just the beginning and it's in a small scale, it's going it, to, it's a, it's the seedbed of something that's going to be produced uh, to something much greater. And that's what I want to go over now to uh, in, in chapter four. Uh, before we go there, let's just track through here. Uh, after you get done in verse 24 and, he's, and you're done dealing with Cain and his descendants, uh, look what happens in verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. See, Abel was going to be the seed in whom God uses as he promised in Genesis 3 after Adam and Eve fell and God just didn't, he just didn't say, okay, I'm done using man for my, uh, to have dominion over this earth. But no, through the woman's seed am I going to have dominion over this earth and, 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 there, and therefore also destroy the satanic plan of evil uh, on the world. But Cain, who lined up with that wicked one, uh, murdered Abel, and therefore God's seed is gone. But Adam and Eve, they, they bear, uh, she bears again, and she has Seth, and it's Seth's through Seth uh, is, is that seed going to come, and, and God's going to utilize Seth. And look at verse 26. Uh, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And it's like there's a period of time regarding Cain and Cain's descendants over the world that they weren't calling upon the name of the Lord. They, had not, they didn't want to, have to do anything with him. In fact, Cain doesn't come back in the presence of the Lord. He stays as he left the presence of the Lord, as it was described um, back there in verse, uh, where was it? 16, is that where it is? Yes, thank you, uh, Cody. Uh, chapter 4, verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And he goes, he goes out of the presence of the Lord, and that's where he is, and that's where his descendants are. Uh, and then there, it seems like there's some time that passes, and Seth, uh, Seth comes on the scene, and he has a son. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And then there's some other things described regarding Seth uh, that take place in chapter 5. Um, but pick up with me now in chapter 6. Something else begins to take place now. As you have that way of Cain and him being of that wicked one and descendants coming from him now, him having his own seed, now men are beginning to multiply on the earth. And folks, it's, it's bad enough to have the way of Cain and him being of that wicked one, but now you have a whole, uh, uh, a whole bunch of descendants from Cain starting to fill the earth. It's not good. And one thing that we're going to read about is that the earth was filled with violence. And it should be come to be expected when Cain, who murders his brother Abel, and then when asked about it, he says, Am I my brother? Who cares? I killed the, I, ki I murdered him. And you gotta, you got to think about this because government isn't established yet. There's, there's no overarching power besides God, as it were, that comes along and brings those things to justice or at least puts a hold on them or a threat against someone doing that. That's why we're going to see some things after the flood. God says some things regarding man's blood. You shed men's blood, your blood will be shed. But that's not until after the flood. So you've got to remember, bring yourself in the context that you're just in the beginning. And governmental uh, uh, power isn't established yet. I, I shouldn't say that. It is, a, it, is a, it is established, but their sense of justice isn't necessarily where uh, it, it, it should be. It ought to be. And, and God does some things regarding the flood to change that. doesn't change man's sinful nature, but he does heighten their sense of justice. But look at chapter 6. Look what now begins to take place. So now you, it's almost like you have this uh, war going on, and, and, and I guess that's a good way to describe it. 
between Seth's seed and, and Cain's seed uh, that's going to be going on. But not only that, but now another group of creatures get involved. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, and again, that's why we did what we did regarding uh, the satanic plan of evil in those two lessons that we looked at, that the, the, the Advis, Lucifer and as well as the other angelic realm, they can be called the sons of God. Uh, I think we looked at Proverbs 6 and uh, Job 36, it might have been, and, and, and it calls the angelic realm the, the sons of God. And what takes place is these angels break the barrier between heaven and earth, as it were, and they start to intermingle with the daughters of men, women on the earth. And the obvious issue is that, that the adversary is trying to corrupt that seed, He's trying to corrupt that seed line. Uh, come back, hold your hand here, and come back to that Second Peter uh, passage, Second Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Second Peter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the who? Angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And, and then and notice the sentence doesn't stop there just a semicolon, but it goes into verse 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And so, again, I just want you to see that these sons of God, there's no doubt, or there should be no doubt, that these are, these are angels. And we're going to see another passage in Jude, I believe it is, it talks about they left their first habitation, and they, they come down and they, uh, well, look at, the, look at the passage, look at Genesis 6, verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And what you have going on is the angels with the, with the women there going on, what they give birth to is, is, a, is a corrupt seed, as it were, or giants. And, and he says, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were, old, uh, which were of old, and that's why, again, you have that terminology, old world, men of renown. Now look what else is going on here, though, in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And he, he utilizes that term again, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great uh, in the earth. And then he says, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And, and I mean, just imagine that. I mean, we think about that, we can think about that in our sense, in, in our day, only evil continually. But again, remember the context. There's no, there's no power because that power, God, God vested it within, with Adam. God vested the governmental power in Adam. He was the monarch of the earth. He was to, he was to subdue the earth and have that monarchy and that dominion, that domineering influence over the whole entire earth. That was vested within Adam. And when Adam fell, it was usurped by the adversary. He now therefore has it. He's got the, the power as it were. It's in his possession. And when it's in his possession, and you have that way of Cain and, that of, and being of that wicked one, and, and therefore, the, when that begins to multiply, God saw that wicked, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and there was nothing to stop him. There was just many of them now who are just saying, am I my brother's keeper? Let's just go kill each other if we don't like each other. And destroy ourselves off the face of the earth. Verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. 
Maybe one day we'll deal with that, that, that issue, but not right now. Verse 7, The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing of the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Why would he destroy them? Why would he destroy, he says man, but then he says, and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. Animals didn't do nothing wrong. What does that mean? Um, it no longer served their purpose that man had started worshiping the creature more than the creator. Yeah, good. What they began to do, although it's not directly taught here, Paul gives some insight on it. They start worshiping those things. They, are, they start ascribing God's gl incorruptible glory to beasts, four-footed beasts, to the, to the fowls, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Uh, come with me to Romans 1. Paul describes this time. Look at Romans 1. Look at Romans 1, verse 20. It's the first part of the gospel that we dealt with on Sundays regarding God and wrath consciousness. Um, it, the very first part of the gospel that you would share was if they don't believe God, uh, then you would provide the information that, produce, that, that, that enlightens that God consciousness that they, that they have with this information right here. Or you go back to Genesis and do it. But look at verse 20. He says, uh, for the invisible things of him, that's of God, from the creation of the world. So that's where, we're, that's where we're at, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And, they, and, and those people back there, from the creation of the world, they, were without, they knew God. Hey, they were a lot closer than we are. And they were, they were there, as it were. Just a few generations, maybe, after. And things are fresh, uh, as it were. Even though God cursed the ground, and things, the things are still fresh. And they knew God, and they were understand by the things that, were, that are made. Uh, they didn't necessarily yet have evolution to come along and tell you anything different. Uh, although that started, that's obviously what starts to take place, uh, but that wasn't naturally resident uh, when, when God created the world. No, the honor and glory went to his wisdom and understanding in, as far as him creating the heaven and earth, the psalmists say. Um, and they were without excuse, verse 21, because that when they knew God, and they, and they did, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now he's going to describe this more. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. I said incorruptible, it's uncorruptible God. Into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They started, they started, maybe they don't have the images yet, as, as far as idolatry worship and making an image, but the, 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 the being, they start worshiping those fowls and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And they start ascribing God's glory to, to those things. And he goes on to describe that they worship the creature more than the creator. And the one who's behind all this is the adversary. And, and you have the intermingling going on and all these things. And their, and their imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only continually. Uh, continually and it's, it's, at a, it's on a large scale now. Uh, you come back to Genesis 6. That's why he brings them up there in verse 7. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The, the, earth, was, the, the earth also was corrupt before God. Look how he describes the earth. And in 2 Peter there, he says, again, that old world, the world of the ungodly, 
The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was, what's that next word? Filled. And then there's no adjective to come along and say it was 50% filled. It was, it was 75% filled. He says it was filled. Obviously, the exception to that would be whom he's just described, Noah and his, his, his sons, as it were. The earth was filled with what? Violence. Not necessarily adultery. Not necessarily fornication. Not necessarily uh, anything else, but violence. People are going after one another in hate and malice and following the way of Cain, just killing each other because of whatever. We, there's not much description here, but hey, look what Cain did to Abel. He offered the right sacrifice. He was jealous. He got mad. He was very wroth, and he just went out and killed his brother. You put that on a large scale. That's what's going on here. It was, the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. There's that second witness there. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Folks, this is so bad He's got to wipe them off the face of the earth. This isn't just something that God says, oh, I'm going to show my power and I'm just going to wipe them off. No, he's it's a judgment. He's looking at what's going on and his righteous judgment, he says, I'm done with them. Not done with man, because he's going to utilize Noah. He's done with them. And, he, and, and they're just in evil continually. They're in violence and they're corrupt and they filled the whole earth with violence. I've got to judge them. I've got to wipe them out. And he does. And righteously does so. And those two issues, what Cain did and, 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 what was, and then what came forth from Cain, in a, in a large mass, obviously, and he had a sinful nature and all those things, but it, it, was, it, was, it was adding to that sinful nature of what's going on, that way of Cain and of that wicked one. They're, 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 see, it's, it's interesting. Out here in that kingdom, there's, there, that thousand years, the adversary is going to uh, in the, be in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the pit there. And, and there's going to still be sinners on the earth, but they're not going to have the influence of the adversary. So there's still a sinful nature, but what we're starting to see here is it, it's their sinful nature but what's coupled with that is the establishment of this course of the, with, the, with the adversary. It's like it's getting added on top. It's probably not the best way to describe it, but it gets the point across. And, and, and that's becoming not just on a, a, a few people are being influenced by it. The whole earth is being influenced by it. That's why he calls it the course of this world. The influence is devastating. And although God's going to wipe it out, we're going to see eventually that it gets up and running again. And God does some things, but he also, what he does with Noah and, and the covenant he gives with man is that he's no longer going to destroy them like that again. Therefore, it's not going to be another judgment of a flood coming on. He's got to deal with things differently. But anyways, that's what's going on here. And again, what I want you to see is the, what's going on with Cain in, in this event in, in chapter 6 is that it produced the world of the ungodly. Not thinking the way God thinks about himself and what he wants done in the earth. Not conducting themselves the way that God conducts himself, but rather in not just, not just coming along and saying, that person is killing people, I'm not going to kill anyone. No, they're going with the tide, as it were, and they're murdering people. They're killing people as well. And not laboring with God, obviously, in, in his business. It's the world of the ungodly that was produced by the adversary. And, and if you're honestly dealing with the information, you're almost thinking, wow, he's got the upper hand. He's got the upper hand. I mean, God's got one guy? Noah? 
And then he's, and obviously his family are thinking, but he's, he's, but it's, it's really, Noah's, Noah's the guy. One guy of the whole world. Folks, don't be afraid to be the minority with God. Because usually, it's the, it, not usually, it is the minority that God uses. It's always been a remnant from the very beginning. So don't get scared when people say, oh, you're in a, you're in a cult. You know, you only got a few people down there. Look at, God's not blessing that church. Your pastor doesn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars and Rolexes and Mercedes Benz and his own private jet. God's not blessing that church. That's not what God's doing today. But any, that's, just, that's just a side note, but it's just one, one guy of the whole entire world. And it shows you God's genius and power and wisdom, but it also shows you how wicked and how ungodly that world was. In so much that he's got to judge it by that flood. We know how he judges flesh, but again, he, has, he judges these angels as well. Uh, we looked at that passage in 2 Peter. Let's go back there one more time. Hold your hand in Genesis. Come back with me one more time to 2 Peter. And get Jude as well. 2 Peter and Jude. Jude's right before the book of Revelation. Second Peter 2. The reason why Peter's bringing it up is because they're out here in this day of wrath. And there's parallels between this world and the old world. And that's why he's bringing it up. He's describing the judgment of God out here that, that, that's similar that's taking place out here. Or that's going to take place. Uh, I mean, you can look at, look at verse 1. He says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. He's talking about in, in the Old Testament there, back there in Israel's program. Who privily shall bring in dam damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be even evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. They're actually going to sell their brethren and things like that. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. They're, they're on the, the precipice of, of that damnation and that judgment. For if God, and then look what like he, and then he goes back and utilizes what we just went through as an example. For if God spare not the angels that sin, he's almost like coming along and saying, hey, if he didn't do, if he didn't spare not back here, which was almost to a greater capacity, hey, he's not going to spare out here. Because the tendency, and for these people to think out here, especially the apostate remnant of Israel, is to think that because they're of Abraham's seed, God's not going to judge us. We're righteous. We don't deserve the wrath of God. And that's what that's these false prophets out there, and 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 all the things that are going on, going on. And he, so he's going to utilize what took place out here uh, as an example. Verse four: For if God spare not the angels that sinned, and there again those the sons of God angels, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved on the judgment. See, they intermingled with God's plant back here regarding that seed. Well, now. Remember that parable that the Lord spoke with the wheat and the tares? And how, the, he, how they're just going to grow up together and then at the end he's going to separate them? That's, that parable isn't something to follow today. Those aren't things going on today. The parables have their utilization. If you close up the dispensation of grace, uh, two of them are used from, uh, from John the Baptist to the kingdom. Uh, two, uh, two right there. There's seven of them. Two of them are used, I believe, right, right at this time, the seven-year tribulation. Two more at the midpoint of the tribulation. And then, one, and then the last one's right at the end. And that's when they're supposed to learn from those parables and, and they're going to be utilized. 
and you have that one, the wheat and the tares, and it's going to primarily take place out here uh, where you go read Revelation the, to the seven church, the, the letters to the seven churches out there, and there's, a, there's the, the synagogue of Satan out there. And those that proclaim that they're Jews, and they're, they're intermingling with the believing remnant, and they're going, to be, they're going to be judged. And that's why he's, that's one of the things he's bringing out there. The parallel is what the angels did with the women out here. There's another a parallel with growing the policy of evil of those tares intermingling with the wheat. Saying they're of God and they believe in all these things. And yet they're, lead, they're, they're trying to lead their brother, brethren away. And, and things like that. And so he's saying, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of Ungali. And, and then he goes and he brings in Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with, with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot vexed with the vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked uh, uh, jump down to verse 9 the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to the reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and, the, and, he, and he goes on and what I want you to see is saying God's gonna pour out his vengeance upon them he's gonna do it just like he did just like he judged that old world here, he's going to judge them out here. And that's the example he's bringing. But again, the angels as well, we saw that man was judged by the flood. The angels as well were judged on what God did here. He cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. And they're, they're, they're reserved there now. And they're going to finally get, get punished when he pours out, when he... Uh, comes and judges them, as it were, in, in totality, and, and, play, and gives them their lot for all eternity in the lake of fire. Come with me to Jude. Look at Jude 6. <clears throat> Verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. That's what we just dealt with there in Genesis 6. But left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. There's, he's, he's, reserved, he's just... God's, God's just so righteous. He's just reserved them down there. It's like they're in the county jail just right now. And then he's going to get them and, 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 and put them in prison, as it were, and, and put them in the, in the lake of fire. He's, he's reserved them to do that very thing. I just wanted to bring that up regarding uh, what took place there uh, with the angels, that they were judged as well. Well, come back now to Genesis 9. You might, again, you might be thinking, well, why are you going through all this? One, again, you have to understand... That one, the, the establishment of the course of the world is taking place, but it's in light of those things. It's in light of the things that we're looking at right now, that God does what he does with Abram. And everything that was established as far as the course of the world and, and, and the, the wickedness that was brought upon the earth and, and all the, the satanic policy of evil, when he comes along and says, of you, Abram, I'm going to make of you a great nation, all those things are wrapped up in that greatness. He says, and it's basically coming along and saying, hey, I'm going to get my kingdom back. I'm going to take back what's rightfully mine. I'm going to vest it within you, Abram. And not only that, but I'm going to destroy the policy of evil on this world. And that's what's in that greatness issue. Uh, look at... Um, Look at so we see that the floods took place the, took took place there uh, in chapter six he he builds the ark the flood uh, takes place come with me to chapter nine now Genesis chapter nine I want you to see some things real quick look at verse 1 and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth 
Sound familiar? Who did he tell that to before? Adam. What God was, what he was, he originally started to do with Adam, now he, he, He's wiped out the world, as it were, and he got Noah and his, his family there, uh, his, his sons and their daughters, and, and Noah's wife. And he said he's, what he wants to get done with Noah, it, it involves the, the subduing of the earth. And now what God's also got to do is he's, he's going to destroy the satanic plan of evil. And it's going to be through Noah now in his seed is he going to do this. Verse 2, and, and the fear of you and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the uh, earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand shall they, uh, are they delivered. Uh, that's a wonderful issue that, again, I wish we could spend time on all these things, but they're not necessarily important to what we're dealing with right now. Uh, but there's some genius into why God placed the fear uh, of man in animals. Uh, and and we, there's one thing we have to note regarding that is that that's the reason why Nimrod becomes such a, a mighty one before the Lord because he was a he was a hunter and now you might be thinking oh what's, what's the big deal again he's a hunter so what I go out there and hunt all the time but Nimrod's the, the first hunter and when God first placed that fear of man in animals now their man's livelihood of how they're gonna eat unless they're vegetarians and vegans, uh, how they're going to eat the, is regarding the, the, the animals and things like that, and, 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 and as well as the sacrifice, and all these things that are involved with that. Now when they go and try to get the animal, they take off. And not just so they, oh, I'm going to try to jump on and get, no, they're going to take, that means you've got to have skill in creeping up on them. And it's skill with, the, with whatever weapon you have to be able to, to slam, to get them. And that's why Nimrod becomes a big, big deal here uh, because of what God does here in, in chapter 9, verse 2. But look at verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, interesting, notice how he brings that brother issue up again, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And the reason again why he does that is because the old world, the world of the ungodly, like Cain, didn't think it a big deal to kill their brethren. They didn't have that sense of justice and that, and that, that power to come along and restrict them and restrain them from just haphazardly and, and, and by their own uh, freelance, just go out there and kill someone or murder someone. But now God says... This is what's going to take place, and uh, uh, what's going to take place is in, in man, he doesn't change their sinful nature, but he heightens their sense of justice, as well as something that he does regarding the, that power that was vested in Adam, usurped by the adversary. God does something to that power. He, he, he fractures it. He makes it powers. And when that, that, that power is fractured and, that, and those powers now are a part of the nations, now when, when groups of people divide up, you have a governmental structure to restrain the violence that once corrupted the world. Not that they would be perfect at it, but it would be now existent so that man doesn't destroy themselves on the face of the earth. Eventually, we'll look at all that when, we, when we're in our edification in Romans 13. That's that ordinance of God. That ordinance of God is, is God placing within man that heightened sense of justice as well as he's vested something within power, within government. They might not, they might not all have an equal capability in it. As, some might be better than others. But overall, they're able to restrain the violence that was in the old world that then was. And actually, it's because of that, folks, that you should pay your taxes. Anyways... That, that's, that's beside the point right now. But notice again, he's got to say this because of the old world that then was of them just killing their, their brethren and things like that. Now he comes along and says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Capital punishment. You kill someone, your, you, your blood needs to be shed as well. 
And there, there's no messing around with that, or there shouldn't be. That's just, that's just the way God, God established it. Uh, look at verse 7. And you, be, be ye fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God spake to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of the, every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. And I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a, a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And what I want you to see regarding that is the issue of the perpetual generations. Is that this is going to go on and on and on until, until he establishes his kingdom. Therefore, God is never going to judge the earth in this manner again. And that becomes important to bring with you because he is going to judge man again in chapter 11, but it's not going to be by a flood because uh, he, he can't, because he said he wouldn't. And so he, 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 he therefore doesn't. So the flood goes and they start, Noah and, and, and Shem, Ham and, and Japheth there, they start... Bearing seed, and that's what chapter 10 is all about. Look at Genesis chapter 10 now. I want to get through this. Let's start here in verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and, and Mizram, and Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rama, and Sabakta, Baktika. <laughs> and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cash begot Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. See what he has there? What does he have? Verse 10, yeah, he's got a kingdom. The beginning of his kingdom. And he got that because, again, the fear of the animals is in man, but he became a mighty hunter. Not just a hunter, he became, a, he became the top guy, as it were. And... Therefore, how are you going to get flesh to eat? Guess where you're coming? Nimrod. Therefore, if you're coming to him for food, guess who can establish the rules and laws upon you? Nimrod can. And a kingdom involves dominion. And, and again, and what you also have is, is, is people under you. Uh, and, and look at this. Play, look, uh, he says, verse 10, The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kelna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kela, and resin between Nineveh and Kela. The same is a, is a great city. And again, I, I just want you to see that issue. Look at verse, um, come with me now to verse, look at verse 31. He, he goes on and describes the sons of Shem. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And he's now going to go on to describe how they get, how they get divided, as it were, uh, through what's going to take place. It's almost like he backtracks and, and starts dealing with this. Look at chapter 11 now. And the whole earth was, was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, and again, the leader of that is, is Nimrod. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a kingdom. What's taking place is there's a kingdom going on. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them th throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And don't take that figuratively, take that literally. That's what was taking place. And they're, they're attempting to breach the heavens. Guess who's up there? The adversary is. The adversary is cohorts. And... My understanding, there, there, there wouldn't be a doubt in my mind that there's more intermingling going on here. Because we also know that uh, 
uh, Goliath came on the scene. He was one of those uh, men of renown, one of those giants in the earth. But what I want you to see here regarding this, this tower, this becomes highly significant in the scriptures. This, this what does he say there? He says, um, the uh, city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And then he says, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the issue of making a name is to establish as, as one is great in the earth and powerful. And it's almost like, again, you have, before there was the world of the ungodly, and they're all in this together, as it were. And although there's corruption and violence going on, now you have one going on almost, as it were, in, in, in peace. I, not so much peace, but under Nimrod's authority. And they start to come together and do some things. And, and build this tower. And again, although the adversary isn't mentioned, we understand from what's already implied in other places in the scripture, especially as we understand this is the Tower of Babel. And we'll, we're going to see some passages in Revelation that that tower, one of the last ditch efforts of the adversary as the man of sin that he becomes out here in the day of, the, day of wrath, he goes to, back to Babylon. And, and try to get this thing going again. It's a very powerful thing that was, uh, that was taking place here. And what you have here regarding trying to reach the, man, uh, uh, reach the heavens by that tower is man's attempt to commune with that realm. And that might not be significant to you, but that's highly significant because God created the heaven and the earth to function together. He created, and, and, and what he did, so that it wouldn't, what he did is he subject the creature, the heavenly places, to the bondage of corruptions, as well as what he did back there with Adam regarding the curse of the ground, and as well as what he did with the flood, he subject the, the creation to that bondage of corruption as well. But nevertheless, in that state, the adversary wants to be like the Most High, and the Most High is going to have the heaven and earth function together. He wants to get that heaven and earth functioning together under His dominion. Having an entity on this earth through Nimrod and His kingdom and an entity in the heavenly places with the cohort, his, 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 his sons of God. He's got more up there. The ones that intermingled in the first place, they were reserved, but He's got more. And you know he's got more because when you reach the gospel accounts, you see them dwelling in man and, and possessing man. Legions of them. Thousands of them. And you see back over there in Genesis regarding the, the third of the angels that he, that he has. And when, when you have a third of the angels, well, that might not be big if you only got three. But when Hebrews comes along and describes that there's an innumerable company of them, so much that you can't number them, well, that's a third of an innumerable company. That's a lot of angels. And so he's got a lot, and that's what's going on here, is man's attempts to commune with that realm, and, and, and the adversary to, to, to have dominion and have them function in a capacity that they, it would just be an abomination. And God, therefore, comes and judges it, and again, man's trying to reach out to those principalities and powers in that. And this is also, again, the, the, that whole issue of the, the fowls and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That begins to be established here again. I know it's not necessarily referenced, but they begin to get into idolatry. And they, again, they start worshiping the creature more than the creator. And God judges that. Come with me real quick to... Um, Look at Revelation 14. We'll maybe take a look at these uh, at another time. Look at Revelation 14. Babel is, is Babylon. Uh, it's King Nebuchadnezzar of, of, of Babylon is the first nation to come along when, in that fifth course of punishment here with Israel to ransack Israel and Jerusalem there. And there's a lot of parallels between King Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Antichrist out here. But all that got established back in Genesis. Look at Revelation 14 and look at verse 
Uh, look at verse 6. And I saw, John saw, another angel f fly in the midst of heaven, having the, the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give, him, give glory to, to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Remember that judgment we were talking about with the angels? Here, it, 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 there's a certain hour that that's going to take place. And worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her, what? Fornication. And he's not talking about fornication as between a man and a woman. He's talking about fornication as far as idolatry. That they were worshiping, like we saw there in Romans 1, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corrupted man, four foot beast, creeping things, fowls, four foot beast, creeping things, uh, and, and they started worshiping that. And when that's established under one kingdom, under one great city, and God judges it, and, and through that judgment, as He confounds the language, He doesn't confuse them, He confounds the language. And, and therefore, He divides them upon, what, when He divides them, what are they all in? They're all in idolatry. And what's going to take place then is idolatry is going to hold sway. And that is how the adversary maintains usurpation of the world. Is having the nations in idolatry, giving him honor and glory, blinding them to, the, to their God consciousness and worship the creature more than the creator. And as well as the other wickedness and course of this world they, that, that now is established, man would just be off in that. And they gave up on God, and therefore God responds right there in Genesis 11. We know from the Apostle Paul, he gives them up, he gives them up, and he gives them over. He is no longer going to utilize the nations to have effect and, and, and subdue the earth. In fact, he's going to give them all up. And guess what? He calls out, one man, Abram. And he can't judge the world again by flood or any of those things. And he's, he's now that one power is now fractured into all these other powers, which is part of the genius of God, that he can therefore make his own nation and almost like come through the ranks, as it were, and establish that nation. And what's going to be is it's going to be the kingdom. It's going to crush every other kingdom, as it were, and, and ultimately be established as that everlasting kingdom out there. And so what, what we're going to do next lesson is we're going, to go, we're going to hit Genesis 12 and see that great nation, and we're going to see all a, a whole bunch of prophetic scriptures that are looking... For this time. And this time was promised way, and that kingdom and that great nation is promised way back here with Abram in the backdrop of everything that we just went through. And again, that greatness, greatness issue, you need to understand, is it's going to have a domineering influence over the whole entire earth. You see what Nimrod had? And then you, you see how the adversary was able to hold sway by idolatry over the nations. God's going to have that, but it's going to be in righteousness. That was his original intention for the world, as he, what he wanted to do with Adam. And he's going to get it back. He's going to just now do it with a, a nation. And he is going to bless them that bless that great nation. And therefore, Gentiles are involved in his program with Abram and his seed. And a lot of the passages we're going to see is because, again, he's, he's not just going to wipe out all the Gentile nations. No, he's going to have a domineering influence over the whole, all the nations whom he gave up. And they're going to come and worship him through the nation, through his great nation, the nation Israel. We're going to, take, uh, get, we're going to take, uh, go through those things, but those three issues... The course of this world, again, that caters to man's sinful nature, increases man's rebelliousness, and transfers the negative response towards God to Satan as they worship the creature more than the creator, was established by these three issues. Genesis 4 with Cain, 
Genesis 6, the daughters of God, or, I'm sorry, the sons of God and the daughters of men, and what was established there, and then, and, and then the, the Tower of Babel, and therefore God, uh, the adversary got his course of this world established. And it's in that context that God does what he does with Abram. And it is just genius. And that's what we're going to take a look at next lesson. And then we're going to, then, then we're going to be in the context of Israel's program when it really starts. What God vested with Adam, now he vests within Abram and his seed with his great nation uh, to be that power over the whole entire earth. And, and he starts getting his program with them going. And uh, there's a whole lot, that's going to be, again, the context we look at everything, and there's a whole lot to look at uh, with that. So, um, again, buckle up. This is, it's going to be good. And what we're going to get with that law is we're going to get an outline of your Old Testament scripture and why things are going the way they're going, why, what the, the, the judgments that God, or the curses that God brings upon them, everything that's going on is all within a certain chapter in Leviticus 26 and that outlines the, the rest of your Old Testament so that you have an understanding of your Old Testament and can enjoy the Bible and, and understand God's program with Israel because it becomes important uh, when you're dealing with our edification as well as when God gathers together both what he does in the heavenly places and in the earth in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into these matters to wrap up looking at the, what, what the adversary did to establish the course of this world, uh, catering to man's sinful nature, <clears throat> and uh, increasing the rebelliousness of man against God. And, um, and, and that's been established, and that's where, that's where man is in, and that's, what, that's where we live right now in that course of this world. However, Father, we understand through the Apostle Paul, you have a whole other course for us. Although we live in this world, we don't, uh, live according to the standards and norms that this world gives, but we should be living according to your course, what you teach us uh, through the Apostle Paul in this dispensation of grace. Father, I'm, I'm thankful to be able to look at these things and understand the genius and the things that you were doing back here and looking at the nation of Israel and, the, and your plan and purpose for them regarding the earth uh, and it being on the backdrop of what we just saw in Genesis chapters 1 through 11 and, and how there was that world than golly going on back there and that tower of babel as the man came together again and you judged it divided it but through that you are going to be able to take abram and make of him a great nation make your own nation out of one man uh, is no small feat and and not only that but to to bring in an everlasting eternal kingdom uh having a domineering influence over the earth is is absolutely incredible so we're thankful to look at these things. We thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully according to the effectual working of your word in us. We thank you again. It's in your son's name. Amen.